Hello, and thank you for joining us today for our virtual CPAT symposium. Uh, we had many of you joined us in Washington, D.C. back in June for our in-person symposium, and we have a new tradition of having a virtual symposium to, help, to make sure that everybody can participate, even if you can't make it to D.C. to join us. So thank you for spending some of your time today with us. Um, I want to also thank our sponsors for making the CPAP program possible and supporting all of our work to work with you all uh, to help improve survivorship care. Uh, just wanted to let you know that the slides and, and recordings will be emailed to you when they're ready. And then we're going to put a link in the chat that includes the schedule for the next three hours in the bios of our speakers. I want to thank the NCCS team, of course, for putting this together, um, especially Veronica Paniotu, who uh, put together the agenda and organized all of our speakers. And you'll be seeing her a little bit later and everyone who helped promote and does all the technical support for this uh, program. We're really happy to have you here. So our first two panels, we're going to be talking with some of our Elevate ambassadors. Back in 2019, five years ago, we started the Elevating Survivorship Program as a way to help support people who want to improve survivorship care in their local communities. And this last year, we had our fourth cohort of Elevate ambassadors. Uh, the ambassadors uh, apply to the program and come up with a, an idea for a project that they want to implement in their community. And they talk about what the need is in their community and how they want to address it. We come to Washington, D.C. for a training, which we had last August. And then we, they work with us and with the other Elevate ambassadors and with the support of NCCS team and also the wonderful Mary McCabe, who is a, a retired oncology nurse and a survivorship extraordinaire uh, specialist who really helps us uh, really with technical support for people working on their projects. And over the past few years, we've had kind of a mix of, of advocates working on programs in their communities and also some healthcare providers who are providing survivorship care and want to help improve the care that they're giving. So we have two panels today of our Elevate Ambassadors. The first panel is two of our nurses, our healthcare providers, who have been working on interesting projects in their communities, and they're going to tell you about it. So I'm really happy to welcome Lori Christensen and Gianna DeRocher to join us. Hello, thank you so much for joining us. First, I'm gonna let you both introduce yourself, Gianna. Yes, thank you, Shelley. Um, like she said, my name is Gianna DeRocher and I'm the survivorship nurse navigator at a community hospital in Southern California. Great, and Lori? Hi, my name is Lori Christensen. I'm an oncology nurse navigator and also the coordinator for our survivorship program here in the metro area of Portland, Oregon. Great. All right, so the first question I have is, what are the survivorship needs of your patients and how did those needs inspire your Elevate project? Gianna? So yeah, at our cancer center, except for our cancer rehab program, we really didn't have much in the way of services or, or programs to really help our patients transition out of acute treatment. And as many of us know, transitioning out of acute treatment back to the real world uh, can be really difficult for survivors, survivors. So the mental, emotional, and physical needs at this critical stage in their cancer journey are really unique. And anecdotally, patients have shared with me feeling lost, alone, scared, but also happy and glad that they're done with treatment, uh, but still dealing with lingering side effects and just not feeling like themselves. And on top of that, now they don't see their healthcare team as often as they did when they were in treatment. So there's a lot of change and many patients feel really lost about what they can do to feel better and to heal. So for me, I didn't want our patients to struggle in this transition. I, I wanted to implement something that would really help uh, empower them with knowledge, support them through the transition and really give them the tools to heal and thrive again. So with this as my vision, my, my project was to develop a class to cover the topics that are critical for these patients in this post-treatment transition. Uh, the amazing thing is that as I started having these conversations with my colleagues and patients about implementing this class, I received so much great feedback that we also ended up kind of growing our vision and developing other related projects. Um, so in addition to the class, we also implemented a cancer wellness program this year, and next year we will actually have a nurse-led survivorship clinic. Wonderful. Lori, how about you? Yeah, um, a little backstory, you know, a lot of cancer survivors experience when they're diagnosed, the focus is on their treatment. 
striving for that best outcome. And then when treatment ends, there's those late, those long-term side effects of treatment, which can include sexual dysfunction. And even though most healthcare professionals are very well-versed, very confident in dealing with issues like nausea, peripheral neuropathy, and fatigue, many may not be as well-equipped, educated, or even comfortable addressing issues related to sexual health beyond placing a referral to a, a specialist to like pelvic floor health. Um, and pretty much all people who go through cancer treatment experience some impact to their sexual health, even though few may be asked about it or even feel comfortable bringing it up. This could include um, concerns around their desire for sex or their libido, issues with pain during sex, uh, dealing with vaginal dryness, and these are very often a reality for our patients, but they're just not discussed. Um, and so I would say this is a recognized need in my community, but also a global need across many healthcare systems. So to work on meeting this need, I worked on updating some patient education forms, some of which included uh, sexuality and intimacy, fertility, vaginal dryness. And these patient education forms had dual purpose. One, for the patients to take home as a reference and to, to read through, and also yet providing a resource for the clinicians as they're discussing these, these conversations with patients. Another thing that I did was to create some display kits for some of our key departments, such as our gynecologic oncology and our radiation oncology clinics. Uh, these kits included items such as lubricants, moisturizers, dilators, and other common products that are discussed for the well-being of their sexual health. Then we did various training opportunities for staff to go through the kits and get acquainted with the contents and for them to ask questions before being asked questions by patients. The kits also included a photo legend of different items that were included with some key talking points that the uh, practitioners or the clinicians could reference, as well as a slip for patients that could take home, listing out the items that they discussed. So if they were interested in purchasing, they would know exactly what it is that they had discussed with their provider earlier that day. And I would say overall, these measures helped patients see and feel these different items and also dispelled some misconceptions during the conversations while having them in the same room, and then also helped overcome some cultural taboos of having these conversations. Thank you very much. Um, and I know you know this, Lori, but in our state of survivorship survey that we do every year, we consistently see that um, sexual concerns are some of the, are one of the concerns that survivors say that they are least, they get the least amount of help from the healthcare team in addressing. It's, it's definitely very prevalent, as you said, but they're not getting the help. But I think part of it is just not being asked. So it sounds like what you did was really a pretty comprehensive way of helping, you know, identify the needs and then helping address it. So thank you for what you're doing. So next question for both of you is what is the most important thing you learned during your time in Washington, DC at the Elevate training in implementing your project? Training was amazing. Amazing. My hat goes off to uh, Shelley and the NCCS team. Um, one of the my favorite things was meeting all of the fellow Elevate ambassadors and just seeing their passion. Um, and just the conversation around everybody's project really opened my eyes to all the work being done by others to really advance survivorship care, not just at the healthcare level, but just in local communities. Um, but my big takeaway was just to keep remembering the why, going back to our patients and their needs, and what does that really look like, not necessarily from my standpoint, but from theirs. Um, I really can't just assume I know what they need because I've read it in the literature or heard it from my patients. Every, every person's uh, cancer experience is very different. Um, so even though I knew that patients were struggling with post-treatment transition, because uh, again, that's what they shared with me, my solution may not have been necessarily what they needed or what they really thought would be helpful. So really going back and talking with patients one-on-one, -on -one, um, as well as people who were done with their cancer treatments, uh, that, was, that was what was really helpful for me. And that really started in our training there last August. Um, cause even when I pitched, uh, my idea to these, uh, patients and survivors, some really loved the idea. Uh, some had other ideas, which 
at first might have felt really awkward because I was like, but I, I really want to do this. But it was really great to hear that other feedback because it really gave me more information and and feedback that I could actually act on. So including all of it, because there really can be multiple ways to provide the support these people need. Mm -hmm. And I really needed to stay open-minded and flexible and let the patients tell me what they needed. That's great. And really just like help you refine your ideas. It's not like they're yes. saying it's a bad idea. They're just kind no. of what you need to do. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Lori? I think there was a lot of great benefit of joining together with other people on the Elevate Ambassador team, whether it be another healthcare professional or survivors themselves, and just hearing that there's so much work to be done and so many different ways to go about going after it and, and tackling it. I think that just the validation that my work and my contribution matters was helpful. And then of course, learning some amazing techniques to take the idea that I had and build upon it in order to gain traction and movement because so many of our healthcare systems are busy places, they're bound to budgets. And even if you pitch an idea, like you may not have enough information behind it, such as you know compiling evidence and statistics, backing up what need you see and how you wanna meet it, looking for what's in place within your health system, finding a few key people or um, other you know champions that can work on this with you. Um, because your boss or your healthcare system may seem uninterested, but they just may need a little bit more of a vision or an opportunity. Um, and I think NCCS, the, the time there in DC really helped kind of um, build my foundation so that I could go back and come up with the different ideas and ways to help move this work forward. Great, thank you. So the next question for both of you is, why do you think survivorship care is so important and how does it impact your patients? Well, so we're finding as, as probably many of you are with better detection and treatments, we're, we're curing more people of cancer than we ever have before. And people living with cancer are also living longer. And this is all wonderful, great news. This is what we want. This is what we hope for. But as healthcare providers, I feel really passionate about a passionate about always needing to keep in mind that the morbidity of these cancer treatments is tremendous for these people. And we really have to think about survivorship care as being from the day of diagnosis through the end of treatment so that we can maintain people's quality of life as best as we can throughout their entire cancer journey uh, in order by, by helping them maintain their, their physical, emotional, and mental health during and after treatment is is really the goal. So that way when people finish, they can really get back to living their life with quality. And that's that's what I hope for, giving people diagnosed with cancer the best odds of beating it and living well after it. Thank you. Lori? I would say this is, my answer is pretty similar to what Gianna said. You know, when cancer treatment's over, there's a lot of pieces that still need a little bit of attention. You know, there's those late and long-term side effects, the emotional mental toll, in addition to just the physical recovery. And so I think it's important for cancer care specialists and primary care providers to unite and help bridge the gap between, you know, continued surveillance, surveillance and um, like follow-up care and continuing their just normal um, health screenings and continuing with health care moving past cancer treatment. Uh, and I think addressing the quality of life topics, similar to the, the one on, that I worked on with sexual health, it just allows survivors to move forward and to, to not just move forward with with side effects, but to thrive and to live fully for all the years to come that they have now that their treatment is done. And this is becoming more of just part of their past medical history. Great, thank you. Okay, so the next question for both of you is, what is the biggest challenge you face in providing survivorship care? Well, for me, two, cha two challenges come to mind um, as I've worked on my projects over the past year. One barrier that I have is funding. Uh, and as many of you can probably attest to, uh, luckily I was able to procure some grant and foundation funding for our cancer wellness program, um, which is housed within our wellness center. So it was great. We already had the infrastructure there. We just needed to make some tweaks, but 
right? That, that funding only lasts for so long. So finding other sources of funding for sustainability is one of my current challenges, particularly for our cancer wellness program. Uh, my other challenge is over the past few years, my colleagues and I have noticed low attendance at our support groups and educational offerings and classes. Uh, we've tried different formats, a virtual, in-person, hybrid, uh, all sorts of different times of the day, days of the week, um, and lots of different topics, topics that we hear that people need to hear about, but at the end of the day, even though we may even have lots of people registered for the class or the program, uh, we just end up getting a low turnout. So getting people connected with these programs is sometimes a challenge for us and, and we're trying to work through that right now. Lori? I would say that a lot of what we experience in the healthcare system is similar to what Gianna said, as far as limited resources and participation, and then just continuing to show benefit um, with the numbers of people who attend and their response to help, you know, continue to further the, the desire and the work to continue offering these services. Great. Okay, next question. Um, what advice do you have for healthcare providers looking to do this in their hospital systems? A few things come to mind. Um, start somewhere. <laughs> start having conversations with your patients wherever they are in their journey because uh, you may get different responses when they're in treatment versus when they're done. Your staff, your physicians, you never know where it'll take you and what might uh, what ideas might come out of it. And uh, just be prepared to pivot if your solution or idea isn't quite what the patients say that they needed. Uh, also using your existing infrastructure and resources to your advantage. Uh, maybe look at them with fresh eyes, which is what I, I had to do because there could be new ways of using them in order to bring new services to patients. Uh, like I alluded to in the last question, um, our cancer wellness program, it's a, it's part of our rehab building. Um, it's a fee for service. It's open literally to anybody in, in the community. They don't have to be, uh, someone that receives their care here at our hospital, um, so because there were so many great um, options there, like massage, Reiki, uh, Tai Chi, we used that infrastructure and those in, um, instructors to create the cancer wellness program because all the pieces were already there. We just had to package it differently and, and then market it. And then um, some of you may want to grow your survivorship program, but need additional staffing to do so. Um, that's probably a lot of us. Uh, for our institution, we leveraged our COC accreditation and the survivorship standard to validate the need for a survivorship nurse navigator. Um, so that's how I was blessed to be in this role. Um, it's fairly new. I'm on my second year, but we're making the best of it. And lastly, in addition to all this, uh, there's so many great organizations out there like NCCS and others that you're going to hear from today that have existing programs and education and resources. And uh, they really want to, they've worked hard on those and they really want to put those resources into the hands of uh, all of our patients. And they're most likely more than happy to partner with you to put your vision into practice. Thank you. Lori? I would add, you know, bring more than just an idea for a program or an offering, bring those details and the information to back it up. Similar to what Gianna said, you know, talk with your coworkers, talk with your colleagues, because there are so many great ideas and ways to look at a problem and find a solution. Um, and then when you're ready uh, to pitch your idea, you know, bring all those well thought out ideas, identify your need state your clear mission statement, you know, figure out what your plan of execution is, have a plan in place, but be ready to, to pivot or adjust based off of the feedback of, um, of the, the organization that you work with or are trying to move. And then of course, just remember why you started, um, stay focused on that so that you don't get lost in the noise and all the hubbub of, of all the details that, um, can, make you forget sometimes why you got started. So just remember that, keep that at the forefront of your mind so that you can continue plugging forward. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, I have a few additional, we have a little bit more time. So I have a couple of questions. Um, can you talk a little bit more about if you have any ideas and I'm, I know Gianna, you talked about the low attendance at programs, but I'm interested, Lori, too. Like when you know that people are struggling with something, they've told you that they need this information, but yet they're they're not coming. Like, do you have any ideas about why? And then 
also for you, Lori, I mean, even though people express sexual health concerns, they probably also have some reluctance to participate in programs. So like, how do you deal with that and kind of getting over the stigma of it or just getting people to open up about it? Sure. Yeah. We've, we've brainstormed a lot, uh, at least myself and my team in terms of the why, um, in my own humble opinion, um, I, I wonder if it, it, it's, it has something to do maybe with the pandemic, right? When, when we were all on, all on lockdown, we had to figure out how to, how to get resources and coming from a, a patient perspective, right? They, many people turn to, to the internet and, and there are a lot of great, um, services and programs out there. So I, I wonder if, now people are finding more of what they need um, in terms of support or education um, from those programs online, which is fine as long as it's from you know a reputable uh, a source. Um, so I, I wonder if that's maybe where they're turning to. Um, I was also having a conversation with a cancer survivor yesterday, and um, you know some of these things might be a little. Uh, uncomfortable or scary for some people to show up to. I think it, specifically for our um, support groups, going by yourself um, as a as a cancer patient um, may feel very uncomfortable. You know, not knowing anybody there. So really trying to to connect people either to a staff person like I'm going to be there. Please join me. Really give that personal invitation, um, or connect them with other. Um, people that are in a similar situation, diagnosis, treatment, so that they know, oh, you're going to be there, then yeah, okay, I'll, I'll show up because at least I'll know one other person in the room. Yeah. For us, we've, uh, you know, queried a couple other uh, organizations to see what kind of uh, attendance they're getting, because we've noticed probably about almost like a 30% attrition from the number of people that are registered for events to the ones that actually show up to participate. Um, and why that is, uh, we can all extrapolate on ideas, but it's hard to 100% nail down why there's a difference in participation. As far as um, sexual health goes, it is a, a tough topic to bring up, and sometimes it's it's a very sensitive, if not sometimes, it's always a sensitive topic to bring up. And so we kind of approach it of, you know, some of our patients experience dryness, and that can come across as pain, or it can come across in a different way, and you can ask, is that anything that you've experienced? Um, we're looking at having a questionnaire that survivors can fill out before their visit that identifies, you know, different pieces of sexual health that they may be struggling with that they could um, fill out on a form and then we could ask further questions. Um, but figuring out the right language that is open for any gender identity uh, is a little bit more mm -hmm. difficult. Um, to say. And then I would say you know, one of the other things we've done is we've been working on a video library. So we've offered a few classes in the past about sexual health and a few classes um, this year about menopause that we've been recording and then posting online that we can refer back to even. So if a patient missed that live opportunity, they could still listen to the education that was provided and then come back and talk with their care team. I know you had more questions, but I forget what they all were. Please, please repeat. Well, I, think I think you addressed it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, another qu a question from the audience was if, if transportation or technology could be a challenge to people participating in programs. And then also if you, uh, if you work with any partners in the community to help facilitate the dissemination of information. Yeah, we have done a couple partnered uh, events recently this last year, which has been very successful. It's a fine balance between offering things virtually because then you do uh, surpass those concerns when it comes to transportation or childcare or, you know, work schedules. But we're far enough out from COVID where a lot of patients and survivors really want that one-on-one -on -one connection. They want to be in the same place as somebody else and have a conversation before or after. And so it's kind of a fine balance of how do you offer those things and in what format to make the biggest impact and reach the most people. Yeah, and if, if I can touch on what Lori said and, and with that question there, Shelly, um, uh, my supervisor, as we were talking through this actually earlier this week about, you know, bringing people to the table, getting patients here connected with these resources. Um, Laura, you mentioned, right, we can extrapolate 
all the reasons possibly that people don't actually come to the door. Um, and my supervisor actually challenged me. If there was a way to, to circle back with those people that maybe registered and did it show, or even the people that we provided, you know, here's the flyer, here's the class, get in touch with those people and just try to have a, have a conversation. You know, what are we, what are we missing? What we're not hitting the mark or we are hitting the mark. Um, what was your challenge? What was your specific barrier so that we can have, again, like you're talking about, Lori, the data behind it so that we have really something more uh, solid to go off of to, to troubleshoot and, and problem solve those issues that the patients are having in order to get to that door, get to the class. So one last question I have is, um, Joanna, could you tell us a little bit more about what's in your um, survivorship class that you're teaching um, yeah. and kind of what the format looks like? Sure. So um, I, it's a, it's a PowerPoint presentation um, and I'm actually trying to also put it into a video format to make it more accessible to people. So in case they don't want to come to a class, uh, you know, very uh, pertinent after the conversation we just had about getting people connected to things. Um, but basically it's, um, we, I called it moving forward life after cancer treatment. And um, just really briefly, I touched, uh, I, I defined survivorship and talk about how maybe that word doesn't resonate with some people, but you know, everybody is a survivor from the day of diagnosis. Um, we go over follow-up care surveillance, uh, making sure that they're getting all of their cancer screenings as they should. In addition to the, uh, surveillance they need for whichever cancer diagnosis uh, and treatment they went through, and then managing and coping with the physical changes that may have happened. So I do go through all the, you know, the the bodily sim uh, systems to touch on the major physical changes that happen with treatment, whether it be surgery, radiation, or um, chemotherapy, and then managing and coping with emotional and social changes. Um, there's a lot out there talking about how um, people who are finished with treatment struggle with um, whether it's um, their, their part with their partner, that relationship, their, their family, their coworkers, getting back into that work um, environment. It, it can be a challenge because uh, many people internally change as they go through a cancer uh, journey. And, and so then they are different, but everybody on the outside sees the same person that, mm -hmm. you know, that was there six months ago or a year ago. Um, and then finding meaning in that journey, um, you know, now that it's all said and done, where do you find meaning? Cause chances are your values, you know, I don't know if your values have changed or do you just feel like a, a needing a, a, a different purpose in life and then healthy living and self-care talking about integrative therapies, um, nutrition, physical activity, sleep, um, you know, getting, doing a lot of good self-care to, to recover mind, body, and spirit. And then, um, you know, handing, getting them connected with resources like our rehab program, our cancer wellness program, um, weight loss management, things like that. Thank you. I want to thank both of you for joining us today and for all the, and sharing about your projects and what you've been doing. And really just thank you for all the work that you're doing on behalf of your patients to try to make their lives better. Um, we really appreciate you and appreciate you sharing your expertise and, and wisdom and experience in the program and, and in your cancer center. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me.